so just welcome everyone as you're arriving um, to our um, the launch of our UK CCSRC web events. Um, we've got Jen Roberts from the University of Strathclyde chairing for us today. Um, and also um, a lot of you may have seen, we were excited to announce a couple of weeks ago that we've been um, refunded as a continuation as a Network Plus and Jen will be joining us as part of that team as well. Um, so we're really excited to um, have Jen joining us. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Jen, as our chair for today. Thank you. Thanks, Karis. Thanks so much. And yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be here um, chairing uh, the, the kind of kickoff of the, this next web um, series for UK CCSRC. Um, I wanted to give, um, as I was saying, hi, <laughs> um, also just give a quick summary of some of the changes with this web series. So as you'll have noticed, today is a two hour event and um, we're going to be hearing from John, Niall and Stuart. Um, and having a kind of formal presentation, but then we're going to have a bit longer for discussion. So the final hour is much more about uh, discussion um, together. And this really, this these event series or web series are just about kind of building this community of interested um, people around CCS and really trying to support an inclusive discussion um, and so on. So we really do in, sort of encourage your participation through questions, responses, you know, um, we'll be asking you to ask your questions and write them in the chat. Um, also, you know, uh, later on, you'll have a chance to actually unmute yourselves and engage in discussion as well, if, if you're able to do that. Um, so we've got, uh, I think we're still waiting for <laughs> two of our speakers who are, who are trying to join us, so, um, or as Niall, Niall might be with us now. Is that right? Yeah, Niall's came. Great, perfect. I know that Stuart is apparently Hello. cycling across town trying to join us, but I think what we'll do is rather than me formally introducing um, jo John, Niall and Stuart, I'll actually just hand over to John now, who's going to say a few words before um, Niall and Stuart take the floor. Yeah, if I can share the screen. Um, so uh, we're at the COP now, and I, 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 I sort of was casting my mind back to um, COP24 in Katowice, which was a much lower key affair, but quite important for carbon capture and storage because it was the one where the cluster program was announced, 170 million for the cluster program. So three years ago, it seems, seems a lot longer. And uh, we had the, the GCCSI uh, had a, a poster up at the airport, which I happened to notice, tucked away in a corner, admittedly, but still there we must pursue carbon capture and storage like our lives depend on it because they do which is which is quite an interesting one and i i was just uh, looking at a, another source a mention of carbon capture and storage from uh, from the current cop and i've got one one frame from a cartoon uh, from the guardian um, which tells us that uh, on the australian stand there's apparently a working carbon capture and storage experiment uh, no idea what it is, but um, they, they seem to have got the basic the basic principles that uh, you put put carbon somewhere and it it goes away. Carbon Golomatic five hundred, so that's quite good. Um, and CCS is the future uh, of coal in their in their uh, parlance. I, I guess a future of a lot of other fossil fuels as well, if they've got one. Very interestingly, actually, around around now we we had the G twenty meeting which uh, among a lot of other things uh, put forward a resolution on coal and the resolution was that there wouldn't be funding for unabated coal so uh, again mention of ccs there uh, a little bit elliptical but it is there so if i could Just look at the, the nature of the problem. This is something I've been, uh, been thinking about a bit and it's, it's background to the, the conversation we've been having, which is, you know, where is the carbon in the earth system? So um, pre-industrial atmospheric carbon in gigatons, and then the surface layer of the ocean, and obviously pretty free interchange between these two. And we've added, a fair big blob of fossil fuel and some land use. And that's that's what's causing the problems. Um, and that's distributed between these two reservoirs. And 
we're looking at fossil fuels as being the uh, possible problem. Obviously, these are proven reserves. The actual resources are much, much larger. You get some idea of the scale. And then sort of what we're talking about today is, is if you're not going to put this fossil carbon, either the historic emissions or the fossil fuel reserves, um, into the atmosphere or the surface layers of the ocean, where are they going to go? And where can you put it? Um, one of the proposals we should be looking at is in forests, uh, soils and vegetation. So you can see a, a relatively limited uh, reservoir there to play with, um, particularly forests. Uh, possibly into the deep ocean that's been talked about. I actually saw a, a mention of the um, mm -hmm. scheme for carbon dioxide removal and storage, which involved growing kelp, oh. sinking the kelp into the deep ocean, uh, which would be interesting if, you, if that's at the billion tonne of carbon scale, uh, or even the million tonne of carbon scale. I bet, there's, I bet there's a few organisms down in the deep ocean, but if they, if they were, could hear about it, it would be very, very uh, pleased at the idea of getting some food anyway. But, but what we're really looking at is actually the much, the much bigger reserve of carbon is in the, the Earth's crust, and we're essentially taking carbon out of the geosphere. And as I'm sure we'll, we'll hear at length from the other speakers, the, the real proposition is that you take carbon out of the geosphere or you have taken carbon out of the geosphere, you put it back. Just one other slide, just to, to give an overall picture. Um, we've just seen the latest IPCC report, the physical science basis for climate. We've got the number of scenarios in that report, and we've got the temperature rise for the scenarios, the numbers, not the, not the temperature rise. So the, the light blue scenario is the 1.5 degree, or a 1.5 degree scenario, obviously not the only thing. The, the next darker blue is uh, a bit under two, two degrees, and then after that, two and a half and higher. So, we're talking a lot about net zero and when a, when a country is committing to net zero, but it does seem, unless you were to get an unreasonably fast drop in CO2 emissions, that if you're committing to 1.5 degrees, you're also committing to significant periods of negative emissions. And that, that means, first of all, it's a good idea to get ready for negative emissions. It's a horrible thing to um, to wish on future generations, or even wish it, but to, to even imagine imposing on future generations. But the very least you can do is at least get the cost of removing the CO2 down. The other thing it says is that, that if you're going to have to remove excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the latter part of the century, and no doubt for a while thereafter, the last thing you want is impermanent reserves of fossil fuel if you, you know it's a fossil carbon sorry in other words if you take fossil carbon now and put it somewhere impermanent and it comes back in you know any any period of time uh, but certainly not in the sort of time that you might be looking at for the lifetime of a forest it's going to be just an extra burden for people who are still pulling co2 out of the atmosphere and upper ocean and as I say, we're hearing an awful lot about net zero, um, but I haven't heard anything hardly at all about net negative, uh, nor indeed about permanence. So that, that's all I want to say. I think we've, we've got all the speakers here now. So um, let's, let's hear the rest of the talk and then have a good discussion. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Thanks for setting the scene there. And yeah, we have Stuart. Stuart has arrived and Niall is here as well. So welcome. We've got Professor Stuart Hazardine and Professor Niall McDowell speaking today. Um, Stuart, I'm going to not say much to Sam. I'm basically going to hand over to you if that's OK. But what I will say is that um, all of our listeners today, it'd be really great if you've got any questions to ask them in the chat. Um, if you could indicate whether or not you're happy to mute, uh, sorry, to unmute yourself to like verbally ask the question in the discussion that'd be really helpful um but i'll be letting stuart just talk 
Um, but I'll be interrupting if there's any sort of questions of clarification as we're going along. So if you've got any questions of clarification, do pop them in the chat as well. How about how about um, you both just introduce yourselves before you share screen and do it that way? So Stuart, say who you are and then Niall. Okay, uh, I'm Stuart Hazeldean. I'm at the University of Edinburgh and uh, I occasionally work in the University of Edinburgh as well, but like most people, I've worked everywhere and anywhere for the past 18 months. So I'm a co-investigator or something on whichever UK CCSRC version we're on at the moment. A geologist by background, worked in oil and gas for a few years and then uh, went back to uni. I've been uh, trying to do carbon capture and storage into the ground since about 2003 or four, and it's nearly there. So there we are. Thanks. I'm, I'm Niall. I, I sometimes work at Imperial College, although this last year I've also been working in uh, the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy in Whitehall, although this has all been from the, the relative comfort of my own home. And uh, I'm a chemical engineer by background, which means I can get about as far as a mass balance, and I'm not nearly as clever as a geologist. Thank you. <laughs> Lattery to get things that. going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mutual admiration. Yeah. <laughs> okay, over to you, Stuart. <laughs> Right. Uh, so I'm going to try uh, making a presentation, if I can find it, on uh, the permanence of CO2 storage and why that's important. And I just need to find the right PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, and so this, uh, I've been interested in permanence for a while. And especially since people started trying to sell offsets for CO2, because it's not clear what people are getting for their purchase of alleged CO2 offset. And it's also clear that there are various propositions for greenhouse gas storage at the moment, which in my view are not very permanent. So people are buying different things and maybe governments are tempted to invest in different things, uh, although they're not actually those things are not actually doing what they think they are. So I'm going to try and introduce here what permanence means to me with a couple of examples and then hopefully Niall, we'll hand over to Niall and Niall will tell us what the conversation about permanence is in the UK government. So this part of just I put this together over the past day and a half so that's why it's single author by me. But I want to say that some this has been developed in collaboration, in conversation with Niall and with John Gibbons, but they haven't seen this presentation, so they can't really co-author it. So it's entirely my fault. Uh, so what is permanence? What's a long time? Why does it matter? OK, so um, let's see if we can work this thing. So what's a long time? So there are several definitions of what a long time is. And if you just look this... Uh, up in a straightforward dictionary, uh, a long time in colloquial language is a long time something or other, which has the implication, of course, of being less than the president in this case, less than somebody's lifetime. So it's maybe 10 or 20 years is a long time. If I look up this in, um, in a legal statement uh, for contract and tort claims, a long time expires at six years, you then, you've then got to a very long time, which means oh, most of us are really, really long time aged people, of course. But what I'm interested in is the contrast between those colloquial uses of long time and geological long time. Uh, so geological time is a segment of Earth history as defined by the Encyclopedia Britannica, as recorded by rock strata. And uh, as many people might know, the resolution on dating rock strata is quite uh, fuzzy sometimes. So a long time, you might be doing well if you get the date to within 100,000 years or two or 300,000 years would be a good result. So a long time is lost within that era. A long time in geology is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. So first up, we have no real clear shared understanding of what a long time is. A long time varies depending on who's um, talking about it. Now, I, I didn't get into the first bit, so John may have talked about some of this. And uh, so I want to draw the distinction between there are two, to me, there are two distinct carbon cycles on the planet. There's what you might call the fast carbon cycle, where most of us live and experience 
uh, things being born, growing, living, dying and rotting away. And that fast carbon cycle is what most of the metrics are uh, concerned with. So this is a NASA diagram. So it's impeccable authority uh, of a version of the carbon cycle. The units in here are billions of tons of carbon, uh, not carbon dioxide. So that's why the numbers are slightly less than you may be accustomed to. So we're busy interfering with climate at the moment by emitting about nine or 10 billion tons of carbon each year, which is about 37, 40 odd billion tons of CO2 equivalent. Okay. And uh, that compares with quite large fluxes coming out of the atmosphere into the ocean, uh, atmosphere, uh, microbes from the soil expiring into the atmosphere, photosynthesis capturing through trees, those are much larger fluxes and the stores of carbon in the soil or the fossil carbon are truly immense. So all this happens on an annual basis, all those are yearly numbers. So that's billions of tons per year. And notice this bit about here, this crossover between the fast cycle and the slow cycle is tiny, is about maybe two billion tons of carbon per year or maybe seven billion tons of CO2 a year. Compared to the vast amounts of circulation, it's a trivial amount but that's what stores the carbon into permanent geological storage. When that might go into coal or oil shale, or it might go into limestones, depending on if you've got a warm world or a cool world, which we'll not go into just now, hopefully. By contrast, what I'm dealing with a lot of the time is what you might call the slow carbon cycle. And what I want to draw your attention to is here, the scale along the bottom is in millions of years. So you can immediately see that the fast carbon cycle I just talked about is lost within the width of one of these little ticks on the bottom. So this is, this is what a long time means to me. And although this is a very long time, and what this plots is it just it's a vague plot, it's a plot, well, it's a specific plot to show you the slow pace of geological events that here, there's the change in uh, oxygen uh, 18 in, um, in seawater. And this is then affected by the increased weathering rate, drawing down oxygen 18 in, as, as the Himalayas emerge. The, when India collides with Asia, the Himalayas come up, lots of fresh rocks exposed, lots of rapid weathering of the rock, and that draws down carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that's why this, this oxygen 18 trend comes in. Then you get to the onset of glacia, uh, Antarctic glaciation, and that accentuates the trend because lots of new rock is being uh, ground up. And uh, so that is, uh, oops, that is a long duration event. And you can see right at the right hand side, then you can see the extent of present day glaciations, the last two million years are lost within the width of this arrow here, this very rapid oscillation of temperature. This is not a temperature graph, of course, this rapid oscillation of, of weathering produced by glaciation and deglaciation is lost within that randomness, that, that noise there. So this is a long time. So we have, again, very different perceptions of what a long time is. And what I'm going to be talking about in the carbon storage piece is long times which lie intermediate between those two. I'm going to try and point out that the timescales we're interested in are much more geological. They're 10,000, they're 100,000, they're 200,000 years. They're not the short, rapid timescales if we're talking about CO2 storage. Okay, so how does climate, how does CO2 affect temperature? Well, there's, there used to be a lot of debate about that. Uh, hopefully there's not now a lot of debate. What's striking about this COP at the moment in Glasgow is that there's very little debate about whether climate change is real or not. Everybody seems to have agreed for the purposes of the scripts that it's real, but you know it's real irrespective of any fancy computer modeling by the Met Office, because you just go for the bad news that Venus is next door to the Earth, where we are similar size gravity and rotation. It's got hardly any carbon in the uh, lithosphere. Most of that's been released. The carbon dioxide's in the atmosphere, and that's why Venus melts the temperature of, as uh, uh, hotter than the lead, melting temperature of lead is the usual metric, 470 odd. So it might have been a habitable world, but that was a long, long time ago. And uh, it's had a runaway greenhouse effect very bad news, turned all the surface water into vapor, water vapor's gone, toast, end of the line, no recovery. So that's what we don't want to go there, clearly, but we are busy going there. 
So this is what a long time means in terms of a, here's a geological analog. This is looking for what's happening today. Has this happened in the past? And it's clear from Earth relatively, well, and I was going to say recent Earth history, but geologically recent Earth history, by which I mean the past 1,000 million years, <laughs> that there have been five periods, at least five periods of intense CO2 release, and each time the world has warmed. But here's one of the more recent of those. This is called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And at that Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, which is when the volcanoes were happening off the west of Scotland, uh, that occurred about 656 million years ago. And vast amounts of carbon dioxide were released into the Earth's atmosphere, vast amounts, and the temperature rose by about between five and eight degrees centigrade. So that's an analogy because the Atlantic Ocean wasn't open properly at that time. So the ocean circulation didn't work as it does now, et cetera, et cetera. But it's an analogy to what I'm pointing out from this article, which is in, uh, or it's reprinted in uh, EOS or somewhere like that. The reference is in the bottom right. Anyway, uh, the point is that you, by resolving, studying the amount of uh, carbon recorded in sediment of this particular time, if you go to the deep ocean sediments, you can record the carbon. And between 3,000 and 7,000 gigatons of carbon released over a period of 20,000 years, let's say. So we're on course for about one gigaton of carbon at the moment. Okay, so that's the trillion tons. So we, and actually, if we do one trillion tons of carbon, then we'll be warming from the climate models by maybe three, four, five degrees. So it all fits together quite well. So the climate models are not calibrated on this geological analog. They don't use this. This is an entirely separate line of evidence. But the point is that took that amount of carbon and that amount of warming took 20,000 years to emit. This is what on the graph, this is what we're doing at the present day. This is calendar people years that we're living in just now. So we're up here in 2015, 2021. And this is the logarithm, okay, times 10 orders of magnitude emissions of the billion tons of carbon in petagrams, billions of tons, same gigatons, actually same thing, sorry, gigatons. So you can see that we've released as much, getting on for a third of the amount of carbon in a blink of an eye, okay? Not 20,000 years, but barely 200 years and less than that. So the rate of release we're doing here has never ever happened in the history of the earth. We're releasing at a rate 10 times higher and we're on course to release that total amount, something towards that total amount in a tiny fraction of the time. So that the bad news is if we carry on doing this, we will get to this uh, Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum by 2159 or before. And I forgot to mention, of course, that the reason I'm taking this as an analog is this is a well-known extinction period uh, for lots of life dying off on the Earth. And so that's the bad news. We're heading straight into an extinction period faster than any Earth system has ever done it before. And the worst news is that if we carry on with the COP ratcheting up on a five-year cycle, we only need 28 more of those five-year ratchets. And we've got to this uh, extinction position. So what I'm getting at there is over these geological long times, we're running these geological long times in human times now, accelerating those that's entirely unreasonable and the result of this is entirely predictable uh, for the planet and we know that result entirely separately from the intergovernment panel on climate change modeling this is uh, whatever it was ar5 i think or ar4 did some of this ar5 made it better that the amount of warming up on the left hand side is directly proportional to the amount of billions of tons of carbon Okay, so we're heading towards this billion tons of carbon here. We're here, we're right down here at the moment, 2010, 2015. And these are various projections for the warming given uh, different warming ratios of doubling the temperature for the amount of carbon trans in, in placed in the planet. So all that's bad news. We'll miss out that for a, a slide. Anyway, so what we can do, what we've been doing, what we are doing in this research community is injecting carbon dioxide. And we inject carbon dioxide at uh, elevated pressure. You've got to be deeper than a kilometer, deeper than 70 atmospheres to keep the carbon dioxide 
in subcritical or supercritical, i.e. a liquid state. OK, so we can inject the liquid and we can put that into pore space. What does that look like in terms of a long time and in terms of what we're trying to do? So there's two ways you can do this. First way, I'm deliberately doing this the other way around. The first way is to do this in Iceland uh, in, a bas in a basalt rock. These are igneous volcanic rocks. These are lava flows. You might remember an eruption on Iceland about three or four or six months ago, which erupt, erupted a bunch more basalt. And these basalts form layers, just like layers in sedimentary rock. Here's a three-dimensional cross-section underneath the uh, geothermal power station of Heligheide. And what these guys have discovered is they can inject CO2 dissolved in water and the uh, CO2 dissolved in water goes into these orange layers, which are extremely porous, almost volcanic ash layers. Look a bit. Here's a piece of core from that. Inject the carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide reacts chemically with the rock and forms carbonate mineral. That's that white stuff there. And that locks up the carbon dioxide forever. It's not going anywhere ever. And you know that works, that, that precipitated calcite, because on the pump they put down the bottom of the hole, they also accidentally precipitated lots of carbonate on the pump down the bottom of the hole. So you know that the carbonate's precipitating. So this is good. This locks up CO2. And that we can say that this will be there for long, long periods of time, because we can go to other lava flows on Iceland, 5,000 years old, 10,000 years old, 15,000 years old, after the last glaciation, we can see carbonate Iceland spar. If anybody's a mineralogist at all, the stuff which dub makes double images through it, that's Iceland spar precipitated oh, wow. from this volcanic carbon dioxide. So that locks that up for a long time. A couple of minutes left, Stuart. All right, so I'm way off on time, so never mind. Uh, but I'll, make, I'll just make the point briefly, I think, but I'll remind me again. So this, on this right-hand diagram, this is the diagram de derived since Iceland, from Iceland. So the time since injection of carbon dioxide is really, really short, one year, 10 years, and you then trap most of your CO2 as mineral on the right-hand side. Go to the left-hand diagram. This is the conventional geological way of doing it, which still works, but the trapping's more complicated. You have to trap the liquid carbon dioxide as a liquid underneath a physical barrier, like a seal on top of a structure. You trap the carbon dioxide by leaving little bubbles behind in the porous rock. You trap the carbon dioxide by dissolving it in rock. And eventually you might dissolve, trap some carbon dioxide by mineralizing. So that also works. And there are three or four methods which trap carbon dioxide safely and securely for long, long periods of time. Contrast that with nature-based solutions so nature-based solutions want to trap carbon dioxide in hedgerows, in farmland, and in forests. So here is Normandy, which has a, an old-style farming landscape with lots of hedges and lots of patches of forest. So that can capture carbon, and people are claiming they want to get paid a lot of money for capturing carbon. And I've no problem with that, capturing carbon, but this landscape doesn't store carbon. The oldest tree on that landscape is probably about 100 years old. So that's the limit of storing the carbon, whereas geologically on the right is the White Cliffs of Dover. This is mineral chalk, which has precipitated minerals. So that's stored the carbon safely and securely. And those cliffs are about 100 million years old. So there's a million times difference in the security of storage. So I don't see why hedgerows and forestry should get paid for long duration storage. They can get paid for capture, but not for long duration storage. So I'm going to go on and click through to get to much further on. So if we look for, if we've got long-term storage and we inject CO2 into the ground and it's stored for a long period of time, then the CO2 influence on the world takes thousands of years to decline. So even if we inject and, and have no leakage at all, which is the aim, the CO2 on the, in the atmosphere takes 1,000, 10,000, maybe even 100,000 years to decline back to normal. So these are geologically long periods of time which are necessary to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And I'll contrast that long period of time with geological storage there on the top line with this very short term period of storage from forestry or trees or, or most nature based solutions, they store, they capture CO2 carbon and store that, but you're going to have to do 
that red cycle, you're going to have to do that a hundred times to lock up that small amount of CO2, whereas geologically you just do that once and you've stored your CO2 for 10,000 years. And I'm going to go to the end point here. So there are different ways of storing carbon. You can store carbon geologically, 10,000 years, enhanced weathering, maybe 1,000, maybe 5,000 years, charcoal in the soil, 500 years, if you're lucky, trees, 100 years, tomatoes and beer, less than a year. So in terms of certificates, in terms of the value given to a storage certificate or an offset, then I'll say that geological storage is the gold standard that has a value of one. Enhanced weathering and other mineral type techniques are less than that because we're not certain about them storing properly. Biocharcoal in the soil is even less than that. Trees are tiny, so you're going to have to store 100, pay 100 times over, and tomatoes aren't even worth talking about. So what we pay, I argue, should be related to the lifetime of the storage. So this should be priced for what you're getting. Price geological storage, price trees for the storage lifetime in these orders of magnitude terms, but price nature conservation, rewilding, nature, diversity of ecosystem, forests win out big time, geological storage doesn't register, so shouldn't get paid for that. So I'm arguing we should pay for what we get and not be confused about the different things we're paying for. So that's it. And actually bang on time, Stuart. All oh, right, thanks, Jen. <laughs> Top intervention <Yes>. by you. <laughs> well done, yeah, um, so I'm kind of astounded by that. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, that, that's great, like we're bang on time. Um, but I just wanted to maybe- There are more slides, of course, if you want. <laughs> we don't need to fill the 30 seconds that you, in fact, you were 30 seconds early. So, and I do appreciate that. Don't waste a, that now, go on to Niall then. Disrupted. Um, but can I just ask um, for clarification, I suppose, at the moment, the way that we view carbon stored, is the idea that all carbon storage is equal, or is that what's being battled about with like Article 6 and so on? So how, how do we consider this right now? Uh, well, OK, let's answer for the UK, and that will try and set up Niles. Uh, I think there's a big conversation going on between the nature-based solutions people who want to get their arms around a load of trees. So in a way, exemplified by the Prince Charles type of uh, dialogue that uh, nature is very good and we need to support nature and I'm fine with all that but what I'm saying is that that nature captures CO2 in peat it captures CO2 in the soil it captures CO2 in trees and wood it captures CO2 in sugarcane so it's great at capturing very low energy system of capture but it's terrible at storing it whereas I think there's a confusion in governments at least being advised by all sorts of lobbyists by the National Farmers Union who want to be paid for storing carbon in hedges and storing carbon in the soil. Whereas I'll argue we should be paying them a lot for wildlife, but we shouldn't be paying them very much for storing. Now that in terms of Article 6 is more about international trading as far as I'm aware. So it's how much, if we capture carbon here, can we sell that as an offset to somebody in Australia or vice versa? And that is probably nowhere near still being resolved. See what's happening in the, yeah, those blue zone conversations right now. But um, that's really helpful. Well, Thanks for clarifying. It's taken them several cops to yeah. get to nearly having a conversation about what matters. So by the time they get to the end of this cop, they'll be deciding to have a conversation about what matters. <laughs> And you do present them with that menu of this is how this is your cost options that might just explode things altogether. Yeah, um, well, of course, there are huge lobby groups who will vehemently contest this because they all see their method, what they can do with carbon storage as being valuable. Now, there is a there is a segment of argument, of course, which says right now we should pay as many people as possible to store as much carbon as possible, even although it's only temporary but I don't think we're, we have got the realization that it's temporary. So what we're doing by growing lots of trees, we're bequeathing a carbon disposal problem to uh, you know, a generation that's 50 years on. So we're still, that's not actually really sustainable. Great, so that was a really helpful um, little bit of Q&A at the end there, but we have got a few questions in the chat, but what we're gonna do is park those till after yeah. the break, after, after Niall. So Niall, are you, are you ready to present and share your screen? Yep, um, 
Thanks, Jen. I I'm ready to do that. Just bear with me one second. Well, I'll do like Stuart. I'll probably give you a couple of minute warning um, if, if needs be. Is that OK? Yep, that's fine. And I probably will need it. Great. OK, so yeah, so I've spent the last year uh, working in Bayes and helping out in Laura Hurley's team in greenhouse gas removals, but I've decided to come here today primarily in my academic capacity, though I will be speaking to the content of of the report and I wasn't as smart as Stuart, so I didn't put a clever little piece at the bottom of my, my intro slide, but I do need to recognize that my thinking here has been, I mean, it's certainly been influenced by, by John and Stuart um, amongst a, a wide range of others, and also many of the calculations and, and graphs and so on that you'll see in this, they're, they're not mine, they're the work of such Celine Chike and my buoy, uh, Piero Patrizio and Augusto Prado and my, my group at Imperial. Um, this is the work that we that we did. Uh, you can go here. Basically, if you Google Bayes MRV Task and Finish Group, you'll you'll see the the, the project that we that we worked on for the last year. Uh, it really wasn't me. I'm not going to read out all the names, but basically, you should see that there are quite a few um, there are quite a few stakeholders from from Bayes, but also Defra. Uh, Treasury, and then a number of externals. And if you look very closely, you'll see people like David Rayner and Stuart Hazeldean there as well. But the key point here is what we wanted to do is tackle this question about if we're going to do greenhouse gas removal at scale in the UK, and if this is going to involve contracts and so on, we want something that can be scaled, but we will need to be able to consider both the national and international dimensions. So, for example, working with people like Katie Sullivan and Tim Dixon. Uh, there we, we need to understand, as Stuart alluded to earlier, that the sort of the interactions between some folks who think that the only thing to do is to put CO2 into rocks, Stuart, and then others who are more uh, who, who have a greater emphasis on the role of, for example, farmers and land land-based carbon sinks. So this is people like Jonathan Scarlet, and so on and so forth. We had folks from um, the financial sector, the legal sector, and so on. So we tried to get we tried to get as broad a set of perspectives as possible. Key point, what follows right now, this is just my opinion. I'm really not speaking in any kind of official capacity strictly as an academic. Um, I'm not going to read, the, there will be quite a few text heavy slides. I'm not going to read them, but basically in order to do greenhouse gas removal, we can steal the definition that the folks in ZEP usually usefully provided last year. So carbon CO2 needs to be physically removed from the atmosphere in a manner intended to be permanent. And you need to do the mass balance or the life cycle analysis to make sure that you've actually delivered net removal. Um, it is possible to do a lot of very silly things and end up emitting CO2. If we want to do GGR, and by, that, by this I mean, you know, we want to have a contract that, gets, that, that has money spent, capital assets deployed, and CO2 actively removed from the atmosphere in some way, we need to know when does the CO2 removal start, how much CO2 gets removed, at what rate, and for how long, and then also when the project gets concluded, and, and this is this this also means when the liability for that store of CO two also goes away. And as Stuart says, as Stuart said many times previously, you know we need this CO two to remain out of the atmosphere for a very long time. So if you put the CO two into a non durable store, then the MRV, the monitoring, reporting, verification of that store to ensure its ongoing integrity may never end. Um, Taxonomy is crystal clear. So, you know, at the very beginning, there was a lot of sort of discussion and at, at the beginning of, the, well, at the beginning of this call, but also at the beginning of this work in Bayes, there was a lot of discussion around, you know, taxonomy. So, you know, and, and I think in general, everywhere I go, I see a conflation, sometimes deliberate, sometimes um, mistakenly, a conflation between the act of removing CO2, the act of using CO2, and the act of avoiding CO2. And these things are very, very different. Um, GGR refers to a very wide range of pathways. So, you know, you can use basically photosynthesis. So you're putting somehow CO2 into some kind of photosynthesis. You're removing CO2 from the atmosphere via photosynthesis somehow, or via some kind of chemistry. Then there are many pathways to put that carbon into different kinds of sinks. So for example, above ground biomass, so the hedges and trees that uh, Stuart alluded to earlier. Also, you can put you can store carbon in soil. You can store carbon in geological reservoirs, as everybody in the UKCCS is very uh, familiar with. Um, you can also do mineral carbon storage through, for example, enhanced weathering. And then, like um, like John referred to at the very beginning, the idea of storing CO two in marine sediments and calcifiers and so on is also an option. So many many pathways. 
Um, I think it's also important, or at least useful, to distinguish between offsets and removals. And so very, very simply, this is where we are today. We have positive emissions to the atmosphere. The aim is to get to net negative by 2050. So it's, you know, in this period, we will not be net, we will not be absolutely zero in terms of positive carbon emissions to the atmosphere. So the idea is to balance any positive residual emissions. We want to compensate for those with some kind of negative or offset. So this is this is the sort of offset piece. Subsequently, the residual emissions presumably will continue to decrease, and then therefore the role of offsets or compensation will be will decrease. But in line with all of the 1.5 degree type scenarios, we end, we start moving into genuine removals. And I think that this, this introduces a really interesting question as to who ought to pay for this. In this period where the carbon removal piece is to compensate for or offset positive emissions from other parts of the economy, you, this, is a, this is an act where, the, where the, the good is accruing to the, to the emitters of carbon. Post 2050, post net zero, this genuine removal piece that's arguably a public good, and therefore possibly um, who pays might change. This is really to, to reiterate what, uh, what Stuart said. Temporary removals do not solve this issue of CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 in the atmosphere is a problem precisely because it, it persists for you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. So in this paper by Anders Lindvald et al. Uh, back in 2019, you're seeing a scenario, and it's only one, and we need to do many more, where you see a pulse of CO2 going into an Earth system, and then you can see how it decays over time. And then we can see what happens if you have a series of temporary removals. And so what you get is, from memory, this 1,000-year removal, so you, you delay the emission, you remove it for about 1,000 years, that corresponds to about a 66% decay, so you've done sort of two-thirds of the work. If you remove for 100 years, you've done much less work and so on in terms of climate repair value. So this is really to, to emphatically agree with Stuart that the climate repair value of different carbon sinks, of different durability or of different levels of permanence, they really vary. And in the context of, of having contracts, for carbon removal for the purposes of carbon uh, climate repair this climate repair value at concept i think becomes a very important so what i want to do now is just to run through a bunch of, of the different enhanced of different ggr greenhouse gas removal pathways speak very quickly about the efficiency with which they remove co2 and by that i mean of the of that one ton of co2 that is that is pulled into the rock or the tree or whatever how much of it get, gets leaked through the supply chain and therefore how much must be Remove in order to actually impact the economy, and then also speak a little in, impact the climate. And then I want to speak very briefly about how this impacts the temporality of removal and also the permanence piece. So enhanced weathering. This is the idea that we're going to, you know, get some get some kind of rock, some kind of al mineral alkalinity. We will have to transport, handle it, basically crush it down then to a sort of fine powder get it out onto agricultural land in general and spread that around. And then when this powder is exposed to the environment, to the atmosphere, it will carbonate and it will remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So digging, mining, crushing, mining, hauling rock, I mean, this is obviously energy intensive uh, work. So again, in my group, we use the MONET, the Modeling and Optimization of Negative Emission Technologies Framework to just understand how, the, how, we, how different types of carbon leakage could occur. These are illustrative calculations. They are not meant to be prescriptive or in any way comprehensive. But the idea is that of the one ton that you might remove from the atmosphere, once you net out all of the other potential leaks to the environment of carbon, on balance, we seem to get something in and around two thirds removal. So one ton stored in the rock, about two thirds of that is actually removed from the atmosphere. This is obviously a dynamic picture. It depends on how, for example, the the energy system that provides the pressure grinding services and so on themselves are decarbonized. However, enhanced weathering isn't something that happens very quickly. Carbonation, react carbonation reactions proceed as you know, sl relatively slowly and as a function of soil pH and temperature and hydrology and a whole bunch of other, other things. The key point is the, carbon, the act of carbon removal is not coincident with the application of rock. This takes time. And again, if we're paying people for when the carbon has been removed, this has contractual implications. So if you then mill some rock and the aim is to get a 10 micron powder, you will obviously have a part of the size distribution and this will affect 
the time it takes for that rock to carbonate. And so depending on weather conditions and so on, you might relatively quickly, i.e. within about a decade, proceed to more or less pre-carbonation, or it might take a much greater time to get there. So there's a lot of variability in there, and this will have significant implications, I think, on project economics. If we think about biochar, so this is the idea that CO2 in the atmosphere via photosynthesis will get trapped in some form of um, biomass carbon sink. We take that, we aggregate and take that biomass where we will pyrolyze it, producing biochar and potentially some syngas and bio oil, which could provide an energy service if, they, if, if this conversion process were available. But anyway, we take this biochar and then ultimately integrate that with some soil. So the issue really here is that whilst you have all, a lot of small leakages, the act of pyrolysis, you lose an awful lot of the carbon from that biomass, about 50%. So that, that sets your upper bound right there. Then once the biochar is into the ground after a couple of years, after about a decade, some, uh, quite a significant, the, the labile fraction of it decays rapidly. And so of the one ton of carbon dioxide that is in the biomass initially, the one ton of, one ton of carbon, only about 25% of it is left after a couple of decades. So again, we have to remove, we have to apply four tons of biochar to have the, the effect of removing one ton of, of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And again, this is an issue. Um, this is an illustrative calculation performed where here we were thinking about forest residue from Scotland and then being applied somewhere around the middle of the UK. So to have a little bit of transport, but you can see that approximately the transport piece doesn't matter. It's really the pyrolysis. However, biochar degrades with time and roughly speaking, biochar can be divided into what's called labile. So it decays quickly and recalcitrant, it, it decays more slowly. And then you've got the half-life of all of these different pieces. The, the labile fraction of biochar, it's about 15%, but it usually is in a range of five to 30% as, as, as indicated here and so on and so forth. So the key point is that, you know, you have, there is no one simple answer. So actually, you end up with a distribution of results. So we take all of this distribution and plot that into the equation. So after zero years, so when, when we just apply that char, we have all of the char sitting there. But as time goes by, it decays. And so after a thousand years, there may be very little of that char left. So when, when one hears uh, people saying, that char can last as long as this is absolutely true it can but of, but what fraction of the char will be left is a key question because again this is this impacts what service what climate what is the climate repair service that we are actually getting from this intervention um director capture and storage again this is the idea that we will take co2 from the ambient air process it through some kind of thermochemical or, or process engineering type type system it will require some energy we, we get CO2, which can then be transported and permanently stored. The, the only obvious point that I want to make here is that the uh, carbon removal via direct air capture is not automatically carbon negative. It really depends on having zero carbon power. And here, you know, there's obviously a question to ask around when the energy system isn't fully decarbonized, what is the best use of energy? And, you know, if you have, let's for argument's sake, say some wind power or nuclear power, or we use that to run a direct air capture facility, or all we use that to uh, displace unabated coal from the grid if that choice, if, if the choice were that simple. Afforestation. So this is really simple. It's, um, you know, you plant some trees, CO2 in the atmosphere, everything's happy. Uh, not remotely. So afforestation, reforestation is hugely complicated. Um, if you want to know more, please ask Solen, she's the expert. But basically, Forest management and, and the way the way that that whole sort of infrastructure evolves with time is hugely complex. The amount of carbon that can be accumulated within a piece of land varies very very significantly. Initially, with time, for about the first fifty years, as you're sort of establishing this forest, and then also then with location, depending on the way in which that forest is managed and so on. And this can be increased a little bit through more astute management and selection of. of of plant species. But the key point is that you know you spend the first sort of 30 to 50 years accumulating carbon in this piece of land. But after that, if the aim is to remove that carbon from the atmosphere for the purposes of climate repair, this carbon stock must be managed and maintained in perpetuity. Um, afforestation, it is very, very uh, efficient in terms of carbon removal. 
the chances of leaking it are uh, very, very low, but the cost of this perpetual maintenance can significantly impact the economics of afforestation pursued for, um, for, 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 for climate, repair, uh, climate repair purposes. And again, going back to this sort of lack of, lack of definition, lack of uh, regulation in this space, I think is really, really important. So when is like a tree kind of like a barrel wall? Because again, you know, we hear about sort of you know, a tree is just very simple and we just plant them and it's fine. The reality is that when you own, when one owns trees, the, their different fractions are worth significantly different, some different amounts of money. And the same is true obviously for a barrel of oil. You get a barrel of crude oil and you distill it into the various fractions, they, they retail for different, different values. So when you have a tree, the large dimension solo, you know, they'll retail for say 25 to $50 per US short ton. Um, it's about per, per cubic meter. One is not going to sell that at the same price as you sell the typical, the sort of the low grade wood for, um, you know, that, that you use for fuel, right? So this, this is this, this to try and speak to this, this tension between using whole trees for fuel versus, versus the, the distillate. So this is really important. What we then see is, you know, it is a really only the, the pulp wood and the lower value fractions that end up as supplies for bio CCS. So when, you, when we're thinking about sustainable biomass, it then becomes really important to distinguish between the wood and the trees as it were. So for example, in the US South since, 20, since 1952, they've maintained approximately 80 million hectares of land under continuous forest. So the amount of land hasn't changed, but you can see that the standing inventory, so the billion cubic meters of the number of trees has approximately doubled whilst at the same time they've approximately doubled the harvest. So it's very possible to maintain this sort of existing carbon stock and also increase the, the biomass harvest. So as a chemical engineer, I naturally think about this as some kind of semi-batch reactor where we have reactants constantly coming in. So for example, CO2 from the atmosphere and then product overflow. So this, these are the, this is the biomass that gets harvested from that from that carbon inventory. So we're maintaining the carbon, the carbon stock of the landscape, landscape constant, whilst also constantly removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And this is the key, in my view, to sustainable forest management. Um, which then brings us nicely across to Bex. Jen, are you about to tell me to hurry up? Just that you've got five minutes left. Five minutes, brilliant. So bio and dual CCS. So again, very similar to biochar. The only difference is that we convert all of the biomass to an energy service and then sequester and store that CO2. Um, it's very, you know, depending on how you do this, it's possible to do this very, very badly, accrue very significant carbon debts, going to doing something silly like chopping down the land, chopping down a forest and replacing it with, replacing it with, with this canvas. And so on, so this could be very silly. Equally, it's possible to do this and do it well. So there is no one size fits all answer. It's, as far as I can tell, very, very case specific. And this is why, this whole area needs, you know, careful, careful thought, um, astute choices, and in my view, regulation of some kind or another. Um, broadly speaking, the carbon removal efficiency seems to be the carbon removal efficiency effect seems to be somewhere between seventy and eighty percent. Seventy-five, seventy-seven percent might be a, an upper limit. Um, if you're being incentivized to remove CO two from the atmosphere, one would want to capture as much CO two from the power plant for the gas as possible. So can be done. Um, so some conclusions. I'm going to jump from the conclusions, which basically say we should we should do GGR as well as mitigation. So it's not an either or, it's not an and. We will probably need a portfolio of GGR pathways. I think um, the key thing really is that we need to focus very explicitly on permanence, and in that context, how we're going to monitor and audit and verify the, that carbon sink is essential. Crystal clarity on taxonomy is is key. What I'm going to do is just jump straight to some recommendations and conclusions. So first of all, liability for the value chain associated with carbon removal is key. Um, I think we need to agree on a level of removal credit or climate repair value, and I think that needs to be a function of permanence. Um, I think we need to establish and address gaps in, any, in the science of um, MRV or monitoring reporting verification capabilities for all of the GGR pathways. This is going to significantly impact their economies, their economics, I think. Um, we need to develop detailed MRV protocols for each of these GGR pathways. 
I think that there ought to be a regulatory body, a regulator of some kind, and it should be independent of government, and it should sit between project developers and HMD, and be responsible for that, um, for verifying that the MRV regime has taken place. Uh, the international dimension is really important, and then the obvious piece is next, we need to understand how GGR can possibly interact with an ETS and emissions trading scheme. And with that, Jen, I will stop. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions you may have. That's brilliant. Thanks, Niall. And again, like spot on, bang on time.